night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. And if you thought Election Day was going to come and go on November 3rd, you were quite wrong. <laughs> We've been dealing with it for months as we led up to the 3rd. And uh, we will be dealing with it for at least weeks afterward as things seem awfully confusing out there right now like to welcome chatty nanny welcome to your first live program great to have you along with us anyway we have a very interesting program um for you tonight in fact it's very appropriate for what we're experiencing nationally but we have uh john olson joining us with his new book called stranger u.s and I know when you look at the, the title screen, it looks like it may say Stranger Us, but no, it's U.S. And talk about uh, the U.S., the United States, being in strange territory. This is very, very appropriate, although this is not what he's going to be talking about. He'll be talking about his book, Stranger U.S., but his Stranger U.S. book explores strange phenomena and paranormal stories from around the country. He's written several books about uh, this type of topic, and they've varied in geography. His first one was Stranger Bridgerland. And then he had Beyond Stranger Bridgeland, then he had Stranger West, and now he's got Stranger U.S. So it should be very interesting to hear what John has to say about uh, stories that he's uncovered around the country that relate to the paranormal. We always enjoy doing that. I hope you um, hope you all are calming down. I know, you know last night we had a best of program or a classic here on the show because I just wanted to sit and not worry about the program Not worry about talking because I knew the election results would be coming in. I knew it would be contentious. I knew there would be a lot of uh, back and forth. I knew it would be late. All of those things came true, and we still don't know who won the election. And I'm still a little stressed out about it, but I hope everybody is starting to relax a little bit. I can tell you this. uh, We won't hear the same type of feud. They'll be feuding, but it'll be a completely different kind of feuding now because all of the votes should have been cast by now. So that changes things a little bit. But anyway, we'll all uh, hopefully wait patiently as we see all of this stuff unfold and all these what look to be challenges and recounts and all that stuff when there's a close election, particularly with a close election where there were new voting methods that had never been tried before or used by the jurisdictions that use them. You know, it's going to be a complicated process. So hang in there, everybody. Good to see so many of you along in our chat room here on YouTube and also on Twitch. We love having you with us. Be sure to subscribe to YouTube at JV Johnson. Also, the Twitch channel is the same thing. Just JV Johnson. Subscribe to us there. I guess that's all we have to talk about. We'll get uh, we'll go to a break here. We'll get our guest, John Olson. I think this might be the third time. This might be the third time John Olson uh, will be joining us, I think. I'm not entirely sure. At least second, probably third. But we'll have them on in just a second. It's beyond reality. Don't go away. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash johaw. That's J-O-H-A-W. Okay, the new book is called Stranger U.S. Our guest tonight is the author of that book. John Olson's been on the program before. His other books include Stranger Bridgerland and Beyond Stranger Bridgerland, Stranger West. We'll be talking about all of his experiences and his work and his research, and we're happy to have him. John, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you with us. Uh, JV, thanks so much for having me back on. I really appreciate that. Uh, I probably uh, shouldn't ask this question, but I can't help it. Are you relieved that this election day has come and gone, even though we still seem to be uh, having what might be a two- or three-week hangover from it? (laughs) Yeah, I I am. You know, just the the fact that, you know, the advertisements have kind of gone away and and you kind of don't feel bombarded with it, even though, like you say, we don't know you know, the full extent and, and not everything's been counted. It's it's kind of ha- nice to have it behind us. But, yeah, it's definitely been a stressful couple of days, for sure. It's been a stressful, uh, geez, I don't know, the whole year. I mean, obviously, 2020 <laughs> has become a four-letter word. Uh, but, yeah, um, you know, I find, exactly. it, I, find it, I find it kind of appropriate that uh, your book is called Stranger U.S., even though, you know, it has nothing to do with politics. It certainly describes the environment right now. It does, yeah. Not only, you know, politics, but, you know, everything that's going on, just the, all, like you say, all of 2020 has just been strange and and just annoying in a lot of ways. So true, so true. Let's talk about where you grew up, because um, you, you obviously it gave you your inspiration for your interest in the paranormal, obviously leading to writing the first book, Stranger Bridgeland. But talk about, is it the Cache Valley, or how do you pronounce it? 
Yeah, it is. It's pronounced Cash Valley. Uh, the word cash in it, it's spelled different. It actually comes from uh, the French trappers, Cache, where they used to hide their oh, yeah. um, their supplies, and it was called a cache. And so that's where it gets the, uh, the name from. But, uh, yeah, I grew up in, in northern Utah in Cache Valley, and um, I grew up in a home that was over 100 years old, and it was very paranormally active. And for the first, you know, growing up, uh, it was really hard because my parents didn't like us talking about it just because they were afraid people were going to think we were crazy if we went around the small town saying, you know, that our house was haunted as kids. So we weren't able to talk about it a lot outside of the home. And it got me very interested in all aspects of the paranormal and just kept me fueled on on finding more and more out as I grew up. You, uh, I want to talk more about your experiences in your home, but in the meantime, um, as you became more aware and more curious, you started to recognize that in this particular area you lived in, it had a lot of reports of strange phenomena. Yeah, and so as, as I got older, and as I became a teenager, oddly enough, um, I had, would have friends over to the house, and uh, they would have experiences, and I would finally had to come out and say, yeah, my house is haunted. And then I started telling my story at parties and, and on, you know, double dates. And, and it was at that point that I realized there was a lot of people coming to me after the fact saying, oh, you know, I've had a, an experience. I've had this happen. And, and by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I started collecting stories from, you know, around my area and uh, getting uh, people's stories of, of the paranormal ghosts, uh, Bigfoot. UFOs and, and covering all those things. When you um, look at the area, give us a sense of what it's like. I mean, I don't know a whole lot uh, about Utah specifically. I know there's some beautiful areas in Utah. Um, but I often, you know, just like when I say I'm from uh, Cooperstown, New York, and I put the word New York into that, everybody thinks I live in a place that looks like Manhattan, which I don't. I live in, right. it couldn't be more rural where I am. Um, so when I th- hear of Utah and I hear the Southwest, I think of, you know, desert and flat and desert and brown hills. around. What is, what's the area like? So um, in the area that I grew up in, and I actually still live, uh, northern Utah is um, very much uh, mountainous with, you know, pine trees, uh, all kinds of trees. We live right next to, just over the mountain range from me, is the West Desert. So you go from um, mountains and snow and pine trees, almost what you would think of of Colorado Mm -hmm. kind of comes to mind. And, and then as you go up over the mountain towards the west, you go right into the West Desert, which is um, sagebrush and, and flats and rolling hills. And so there's such a diverse um, ecosystem, I guess you could say. We fall under the category of a high desert, but uh, we do get quite a bit of snowfall here, and a lot of skiing in this area. But Utah is, is, I mean, it's really vast and large. And because of that, you have everything from Arches National Park and um, all those in the south, which is a lot more hot and deserty, um, all the way to the north here, which is, like I said, um, mountains and, and pine trees and wilderness a lot. Uh, I have a friend that lives in Park City. Is that anywhere near you, what where, where we're talking about? Um, um, so Park City is south of me uh, towards Salt Lake. Um, if you head directly east from uh, from Salt Lake, you would run into Park City. Um, so uh, Salt Lake City sits at the edge of the um, basically the mountain range, which uh, runs north and south through Utah. And so if you go east from Salt Lake, that's where you get into the Uinta Mountain Range um, and the if you've heard of Skinwalker Ranch, that oh, of course, yeah. is in part of uh, the Uinta Mountain Range. And so um, it's further north close to me, but I'm right up near the Idaho kind of Wyoming border, of, gotcha. um, very much to the north. Gotcha. What a beautifully diverse country we have. You know, you can, when you, if, if you, uh, I've never driven coast to coast, I've come close. Um, but right. w- when you, when you look at the, the variety and the spectacular, uh, natural wonders and natural environment we have in this nation, um, it's, it's quite amazing and striking. And, and just hearing you describe that tells me I really have to visit Utah someday because I, <laughs> I have not done that. Um, you bring up the Skin, Skinwalker Ranch and you've obviously written extensively about the area that you live. What is 
is it about the you know Utah or the Southwest that it gives it what seems to be a very high uh, propensity of this paranormal type activity? You know, I, I'm I'm not sure what brings it in, but it sure does have a lot. Um, like you mentioned, the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, anybody who's read or you know watched anything about it, they have everything from apparitions to yeah. Bigfoot and UFOs. That seems all connected, almost in that area, almost like it's a vortex. And a lot of Utah is like that. Um, I've lived here my whole life, and I still get stories and people coming to me that are that say, "Oh, have you heard about this place in Utah?" And I'm like, "No, I haven't." And they tell me about it. So even now, I'm learning about more and more just in my you know neck of the woods that is so paranormal. Let's talk about this house you grew up in and the fact that your parents really didn't want you talking about the things you were experiencing for fear of maybe ridicule or harassment or whatever it happens to be. But tell us about some of the experiences that you had. So um, growing up, some of, the, some of the things that went on when I grew up um, was the, the spirit in there, and I, I don't, it's not evil. It's never been evil, but it's had a very uh, kind of a trickster vibe to it. Um, loves to play tricks on people. And um, some of the, the things that would go on, of course, there was always footsteps, especially on the staircase um, that would go, uh, that went from the main floor to the second floor. And um, oddly enough, when we were little kids, you know, you always come up with something to explain what's going on. So we came up with calling it the stair monster because that's what we heard a lot was the footsteps, whether it was heavy boot steps or kids footsteps running up and down. Um, And there were also, you know, like I said, a lot of trickster things that go on that would go on. I remember many times I would be sitting in the front room and I would hear my mom call me from the kitchen. So I would get up and walk around and go into the kitchen and my mother wouldn't be there. And I would have to hunt down where she was, and say, you know, did you call me? No, I didn't call you. And and that would that would happen on occasion. Um, in fact, my parents still live in the house, and there's still things that go on oh, wow. in the house mm-hmm. uh, to this day. And um, about a year ago, in fact, I was I stopped by to visit. And my parents weren't home; uh, the car was gone, and so I just pulled in and went through the back door. And just out of habit, I called out, "I'm home," you know. And my dad's voice came from the front room, said, we're in here. And I thought, well, maybe my sister borrowed the car or something. <laughs> and I walked in there, and sure enough, there's nobody there. And oh, wow. uh, the TV's off. And so I sat down to read a book and wait for my parents to get home. And it went about 15 minutes, and I heard the back door open and close, and my dad's voice say, hey, we're home. And again, <laughs> when I went into the kitchen, nobody's there. Oh, wow. The so car's twice. not there. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> right. And so, and at that point, I heard uh, laughter coming from the front room, and I thought, well, you got me again. That was, you know. And so it was a lot of stuff like that, uh, kind of prankster things that went on um, throughout the house. You, uh, you, you used the, the pronoun we uh, when you were talking about the stare monster. Did you have siblings? I do, yeah. I have an older sister. Mm-hmm. Um, she's about four years older than me. And then I have a younger brother that's a year younger than me. Um, and so we would talk about it a lot and, um, we would, you know, talk about our experiences and we, we would be able to talk to my mother, um, cause she was very open to it other, you know, other than keeping it in the house. Oddly enough, my dad back then, he would tell us, you know, our house isn't haunted. Don't tell people, you know, that our house is haunted. And, um, but then I would, I found out years later that he, he himself was having, experiences and not sharing it with anybody because again he didn't want to you know spread that out that the our house was haunted and that uh, maybe we were a little crazy which luckily now there's not that stigma out there i believe because of different shows that go on and, and different people who are talking about it um but definitely back then in the early 80s there was definitely that fear going around that, oh, you don't want people to think you're crazy. Was your father or your parents' hesitancy to talk about this, Was it, did it have anything to do with religious beliefs? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I did grow up uh, in a religious home, um, but in a lot of ways, um, my religious beliefs uh, growing up um, just 
reiterated the fact that there is life after death and in that fact that um, they could be around us at any time, uh, people who have passed on. And so I don't think it had so much to do with religion, just the fact that it was a small town and, you know, people like to kind of talk in small towns. Sure. And again, back then, you know, you didn't have the shows like we do now and we don't have people talk about it like we do. And, and even today, I find when I'm interviewing people, they're a lot more open about their stories. Yeah, there's no question that uh, particularly paranormal reality television has introduced these conversations to the mainstream discussion as opposed to these, you know, kind of whispered discussions in the back of the room, uh, which has helped. It's 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 allowed many stories to come forward that wouldn't otherwise, and it's allowed a more scientific approach to the idea and to the concept and to the phenomena, and I think that is helping us find answers. We don't have many answers yet, but it's helping us find them for sure. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, different shows that, uh, that you watch, it's, it's good to get, um, especially when they're helping people and they come into a house that somebody, you know, feels it's haunted and, and they're able to show them, uh, you know, it may or may not, you know, it could, I, I love how, especially when Jason does it and he's either able to debunk or say, well, this is what's going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is what we can do about it. I know in my personal, um, you know, life when I've dealt with, helped people um, who've come to me and said, oh, I, you know, I think my house is haunted, and, and I was able to sit down with them and, and kind of explain that, you know, it could be this, could be that, and when we're able to mark those things off, I'm still able to say, you know, in my experience, the people, when you have somebody in your house a haunting or whatever it is, a lot of times, you know, these are just people who have passed on, and just like you meet somebody on the street, you know, nine out of 10 people you meet are going to be pretty good people. Right. That one tenth person you got to look out for, but. Yeah, and that that's true too. Do you, as, as you looked back or as you, you know, became more paranormally aware and maybe started to do some research, I know you did a lot of reading about it. Um, did you start to understand maybe what was going on in the home? And did you ever find out anything in the home's history that may have explained what was happening? Um, you know, I did have an experience. Um, well, um, I remember when I was eight years old, I, I had an experience with um, this this apparition that we did see on occasion. Um, I remember I came home from school, made a sandwich, went and sat on the couch. And before I could turn the TV on, this apparition of a tall man with a wide-brimmed hat and white shirt and overalls walked into the front room and sat in the rocking chair across from me and started rocking back and forth. And um, even though most of the time I wasn't afraid at that point, I, I was kind of, you know, scared being eight years old or in eighth grade, I guess I should say. And, um, I closed my eyes and when I opened him, he was gone. The chair was still rocking for a minute and was, was gone. And when I talked to my mother, she had also seen this apparition of a man with a wide brimmed hat, a white shirt and overalls and tall and skinny. And, um, Several, about, oh, I'm going to say about 10 years ago, my uh, grandmother passed away, and she lived about a block away from us, not very far at all. And <clears throat> my family, the, the house that I grew up in, my family had, had owned that and been part of that back uh, near the turn of the century. Whereas they weren't the first people to, to build the house, but they had bought it before. And when my grandmother passed away and we were going through the old photo albums, I remember I flipped over the page and I about fell out of my chair because there is the house I grew up in hmm. and a tall gentleman with a wide brimmed hat, white shirt and overall standing in front of the house. Oh wow! And I'm like, Oh, who is this? You know? And we turned it over the picture over and it was a great, great uncle who had owned the house in the twenties. And so we know that that's the apparition that we see is a great, great uncle that owned the house. Oh, that's really cool. Now, so that means that the house has been in your family for quite some time. Yeah, it has. Um, it, it, um, the original owners, it was originally built. I've done quite a bit of research on it. Um, mm -hmm. Back in the Old West, when the railroad was being built all over the western United States and, and part of the east, in fact, in order to pay for the, the railroad, the United States gave the railroad companies land, right. and then they would build things or sell them off to farmers as they moved in. And the land was originally part of the railroad company's land, 
And then he, they sold it off to a gentleman who built the farmhouse and had a farm here. And then um, after he passed away, um, a, near the, um, I, I want to say 1960s, or 1916, sorry, is when my great-great-uncle purchased it and raised a family there. So from then on, it was kind of in my family. The uh, last question I'll ask you about the house in the area is obviously Utah has a rich Mormon history, and the Mormons have such a fascinating story. We've talked about their stories uh, quite a bit, and their their you know the original founding in upstate New York and their move across the country with, with several stops along the way, finally settling in uh, what was considered to be wild country uh, in Utah mm-hmm. and building quite a, an active and robust society there. Um, mm-hmm. Is there any Mormon history in the in, in the area that you're in, and could that have anything to do with fueling any activity? Oh yeah, it definitely could. Um, I'm I actually trace my um, ancestors on my father's side back to the first pioneers that moved to Cache Valley. Wow. So, um, uh, which is kind of neat for me, I, I you know to be able to trace it, you know, all the way back through there. And with some of the sightings, in fact. Um, in one of my books, I'm trying to remember exactly which one it was, uh, a lady and her mother was driving, and all of a sudden in the field next to them, they saw a wagon train, you know, filled with kids and and animals, and, and they thought it was a recreation, and they thought, oh, this is so neat. And so they got down the road to where they could turn around and come back because they wanted to see it again. But when they got back, it was gone, and they called the... Um, Western Heritage Center, which is right near there, and said, oh, what happened to your, you know, recreation? You know, we wanted to see more of it, and they didn't have any idea what they were talking about. It was maybe a vision of the past of of some of the pioneers that had moved into the valley. So I definitely think that has a lot to do with with um, the the vibe and, and the paranormal that's going on here in the valley. Now, I know you said that this uh, man that you, this apparition you saw with the wide brim hat and the white shirt and all of that, you traced it back and you recognized that it was your great uncle. However, when you first mm-hmm. des- started describing that, you know, when you start to say you saw an apparition with a hat on, people automatically think hat man or something very sinister. And I'm mm-hmm. assuming that there's no connection with the sinister hat man that we've all heard about and talked about. Uh, and you probably haven't had those experiences, but I got to ask, any connection? Um, no, there's no connection between the two um, other than the wide brim hat. Like I said, when I when I saw the apparition, the only thing I couldn't make out was his face, but I could see, and I could see through him. It was a full body apparition, and I could see his white shirt and his overalls and and all of that. But um, I do know what you're talking about with the the um, the hat man that they talk yeah. about and um, the association with um, some of the uh, shadow people that you, that you talk about. Because yeah. I've actually you know interviewed quite a few people who've had experiences with those those entities, but I, they're not connected uh, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Those two aren't connected. You know, I saw a documentary, I think it was on uh, Amazon Prime, and I think it was called The Hat Man, maybe. Mm. That sticks out in my mind. All I know is it was creepy as heck. And uh, I, actually, I, when I was watching this thing, I thought, this is a documentary, but this is far more uh, disturbing than many fictional horror films that I've seen in any time recently. So the, the Hatman story right. kind of ha- has a bit of a, a place blazed in my mind that, that sends a shiver down my spine when we start talking about it. Um, and I'm glad that this that your story isn't that one, because it is a bit of a disturbing one. But tell us more about your, your paranormal evolution, if you will. You you became curious because of these experiences that you were having. You started to read, you started to research. Um, you know, obviously there's a, there's a bit of a path that led you from that to being the author of uh, several books on these topics. Yeah, so when I first started out, again, like I said, I was 17 or 18, and I started collecting the stories. And, and back then, you know, in early 90s, um, there was no internet. There wasn't a lot of, you know, way to get you know, get out and um, get a wider view of the paranormal um, other than reading books about it. But it was mostly, for a long time, it was just word of mouth. So, of course, a lot of it was just, you know, local stories. Or um, one thing that would happen a lot is I would have people come to me and say, oh, well, this happened to my uncle or my friend's friend. And because I wanted it firsthand, 
sometimes it would take me a long time to hunt down the actual person that it happened to and um, and start collecting them. And, and interestingly enough, um, about five years ago, I, I remarried, and um, my my wife, you know, I first I had to explain to her what you know all of my documents were that about the stories and 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 how I got into it and. And she was like, well, what are you going to do with them? And I said, well, you know, we're going to write a book someday. And she goes, well, why don't you do it now? And she was so great to, you know, be supportive and help me with that first book. And because the first book was Stranger Bridgeland, and it was a lot of the stories that were collected here locally. And as that book got out, <clears throat> more people were able to contact me. I was able to use Skype and, and other things and other means to you know, broaden the horizon and, and gather stories from further out and further out. And as I've kept going, I just continue to gather stories. Um, even locally, I still gather stories, but it's gone wider and wider to the last one here, which was Stranger U.S. So um, it's just been a great journey um, doing it. I, I just love meeting people and hearing their stories and, and getting to document them. How did you start that first book as far as collecting the stories and talking to people who had these experiences? You know, when you, when you do it for the first time, you're kind of learning as you go, right? Right. Yeah. It, it, it takes a little bit to, um, you know, take the stories and, you know, interview people and you, you know, you, I, I turn them into a first person story. So you're hearing it from their point of view and, um, and, and going from there, a lot of people, uh, even today um, are okay with sharing their stories, um, but they want their name changed, which I'm fine with. Um, and I also have, you know, I've still got a stack of stories of from people who've let me collect their story, but they're not yet ready for me to be able to write them up. Mm. And so, but every time another book comes out, a few of those people relent and say, you know, I see what you're doing. I, I understand, you know, I'm okay with it. And so, um, it's it's just a process over and like like you say every book you know the first one is a little bit a little bit smaller it's a you know a little bit different and every time I think I, I refine it and it gets a little bit you know I, I not necessarily better because the stories are the stories but just the, the process itself itself gets better as you talk to people uh, um, and you collect their stories do you have any uh, I, I I don't know what they would be called. Maybe trigger questions or threshold questions that you ask to get any get some kind of authenticity about the stories. You know, I have to go off of my gut, and a lot of times, you know, I'll talk to people, and um, it, I, I, I sometimes I'll have people contact me, and they're like, "I saw a ghost," and and that's their story, and yeah. it takes a lot to kind of drag out and find out what's going on, and and I you know I still collect it. I get the you know the story out of them eventually. But um, some, uh, I, I like to put the stories in the book. Um, my, my wife and my editor helped me select what stories would be best for each book because, of course, some, uh, you know, uh, ring a little bit more true and some are just really strange and out there, and I, I'm kind of drawn to those. But when I'm interviewing somebody, I kind of have to go off of a gut feeling, I guess you would say, on whether it's true. And um, it's interesting how many people, especially if it's a really scary experience that they've had, when they start telling the story and relating it to you, you can hear the, you know, the fear returning to them. You can, you know, they go right back to when it happened. And, you know, when I hear that and I can hear the sincerity of, of what they went through, that it solidifies in me that they're, you know, they're not just making this up. Yeah, I suppose, and I and I know this to be true from my own experiences and talking with people as well. You can hear the emotion in their voice generally, and you can tell that they're sincere. And regardless of what that experience may or may not have been, it's certainly real to them. And you have to assume it's it's you know, le- legitimate uh, by the way they're telling it. Uh, but when it impacts someone like that, there's something to it. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of them, you know, whether it's only one one you know, a uh, thing that is paranormal thing that's happened to them, or they've had, uh, you know, several incidents that happen, um, you know, y- it does affect their life. Um, it does, uh, you know, it, you can't have an experience like that, whether it's seeing a UFO or Bigfoot or, 
you know, interacting with a ghost and not have it broaden your understanding of the universe. And it makes you, and, you know, a lot of people go through a confusion and uh, a state of, you know, questioning themselves. And one thing that I think helps people to talk to me is the fact that I have gone through this. I, it, I had my own experiences. And when I share those experiences, people are like, oh, this guy knows what I'm talking about. This guy understands the feelings that I went through. And uh, they're more apt to open up to me, which I, I appreciate their trust. As you started to expand the book series and you looked at larger parts of of the geography of the country to the point where the most recent book is Stranger U.S., so therefore it's the whole country, did you find any commonalities in the types of stories? I guess the question can be asked this way. Did you find the same kinds of stories everywhere you looked, or do certain stories have certain geographical regions that they kind of appear in and then don't appear, appear in the others? Um, you know, actually, there's kind of both. Um, there's definitely um, geographical areas that seem to have um, their own, you know, I guess, visions or, or you know, monsters, whatever you might call it. But also there's um, certain aspects that seem to transcend, transcend across the country. You mentioned the, the, um, the man in the hat or... Um, uh, shadow people. That seems to be something that happens all over the country and even outside of the country. Um, but there is definitely um, areas that uh, that have their own certain niche. I know that um, in the uh, Northeast, uh, a lot of the dogman sightings happen, and that seems to be, you know, a localized area there. Um, one thing that I did find interesting is. When um, I'll have I'll have a story, and I'll talk about it, or somebody will read my book, and uh, several times they've contacted me and said, "Oh my goodness, I until I read your book, I thought I was the only one that had had that experience," mm-hmm. and the, and that will happen a lot with the black eyed kids. That happens quite a bit with that. Um, in my one of my first books, I had a story about um, a young man who was uh, camping. And something was impersonating his cousin, trying to draw him out of camp. I called it not my cousin. And what was amazing was that, you know, I'd only ever heard of that from this one individual that I interviewed. But when I talked about that story, I had several people contact me that said, you know, I thought I was all alone. I also had an experience where um and something that was mimicking my cousin was trying to draw me to an area that I shouldn't have been. And I was able to gather their stories. Oh, wow. um, so, it, yeah, so it's definitely, there's stuff like that that happens that, um, that seemed to happen in, in a lot of different places in, in my last book in the stranger U S I interviewed a, a young lady who, well, she's not very young now, but as a young lady, uh, she was coming home from school and she lived with her grandmother and her cousin who lived the town over would always come for the weekend. And as she, she'd missed the bus from school. So she was walking home. And as she was walking by an abandoned building, her cousin was in the building trying to get her to come, you know, with her into the building. And so she followed into the building and then her cousin was further in the building. And she's like, what are you doing? We're not supposed to be in here. You know, I know there's homeless people that are around here. What are you doing? And she just kept drawing her further and further in. And she finally, you know, got the feeling that something was wrong and she ran out. And when she ran home to her, to her grandmother, South, where she lived, her cousin was there and had never left the house the, after, the entire afternoon. And so um, things like that seem to be uh, a story that people are experiencing all over the country. Okay, so we've got to talk about this particular phenomenon a little bit because I'm, I've not really heard this before. You're bringing it to my attention for the first uh, time. This was introduced to you by a single story that you wrote about, and once you wrote about it and published it in one of the books, you had other people come forward talking about it. Um, did you ever get any information that was that allowed you to understand what this phenomena might be? Is it a cryptid that is that is doing some kind of shape shifting and, and impersonating, or is it a spirit like a ghost type 
uh, entity that is, again, assuming the identity of someone that is familiar to you in order to lure you in someone? Is it demonic? You know, do you have any idea what we're talking about here? You know, I, I would only be speculating what it is. Um, and But, you know, to me, um, it feels almost like um, either something demonic or something on the, the side of, the Fae. Uh, I don't know if you've heard. Uh, yeah, sure. You, know, if you guys mm-hmm. talk much about that, mm-hmm. but um, that actually goes through um, because a lot of times when I when I read story or when I you know write stories and I interview people, I will try and connect it back to something else and see if there's you know written history of it. But um, the Fae have been known to do that you know, back through time, mimic people and and try and lure people into the woods. Um, and, you know, they used to tell kids um, in, um, in Western Europe, the big thing was, you know, never follow anybody into the woods, that, even if you think you know them, because um, it's the Fae that are trying to kidnap you. And and so, I, you know, I always kind of go back to that, that um, it could be a Fae spirit or something like that trying to lure uh, the children or whoever it is um, away for whatever purpose. I'm not sure, because who knows if... You know, with all the people that go missing uh, in yeah. the wilderness and yeah. everything like that, you have no idea if it's um, somebody who's followed too far and you just never knew what happened to them. But so, it's, it's definitely something that's really kind of creepy. Yeah, it's very creepy, and I'm very fascinated by it. Uh, it's it's one of those things that, um, you know, we talk a lot about some of, this, some of these topics we talk a lot about. We talk a lot about Bigfoot. We talk a lot about ghosts. Mm-hmm. This particular topic is relatively new, and it has an air of sinister to it that I find very fascinating. Uh, how how common are these now that you've written about it and people are reaching out to you saying, I've had a similar experience? I mean, would you say this is a common occurrence? Would you say that it's something that we, there, it could actually ha- start to have its own kind of discipline that you could study and write about? Um, you know, it'd be interesting to, to, to be able to do that. Right now, I've, I've only got four uh, documented firsthand accounts um, of it. I've written about two of them. Uh, the other two I haven't written about. And they cover, um, oddly enough, two of them um, are from people who never n- knew each other, um, but all happened in the same wilderness area. Oh. And uh, were about, I would say, maybe 10 years apart, but less than, less than three miles apart were um, the two people that I interviewed. And um, the other one was in uh, central northern California, if I remember correctly, and another one was in the southern part of Utah, one of the other ones I haven't written about. And it all seems to spread over about 20 years or so. Um, It's definitely one that I keep, you know, my ear to the ground, and and I'm always um, happy to, to, you know, listen to somebody if they've had an experience similar to that. I think it's really funny that um, and interesting that out out of the four, um, three of them were actually cousins, so they were, you know, uh, blood relatives. That three they of mimicked. the four, three um, of the four were related and all had a similar experience. Yeah. Well, no, they didn't. They weren't all related together. But what I'm saying is that when they mimic, when oh, whatever it is, it was, mimicked, a, cousin. It, yeah. it was a relative. Yeah. That, um, and it was all um, somebody that they looked up to, an older cousin um, that they looked up to. So it was definitely some someone that. A child or or a teenager might feel more, um, I guess, more apt to follow, you know, into somewhere where they shouldn't go. Um, I'm assuming that would be by design, but, you know, it's hard to tell. Um, I've done one of my favorite um, books to read, and I'm sure you've heard of the Missing 411 series. David Pilates? And so... Yeah, the David Pilates. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered if there's some sort of connection there, too. Sure. Um, of the people that go missing and, and, you know, they're not found or, you know, they're found in weird places or whatever. You just wonder if there's some, some sort of connection there too. But uh, at this point, I don't know. So we're talking tonight with John Olson. John is the author of the stranger series of books. His newest is called stranger U S he's also written stranger Bridgerland, stranger West beyond stranger Bridgerland. So again, tonight we're talking about strange stories, strange phenomena, strange paranormal occurrences uh, around the country. Uh, John Olson's new book is called Stranger U.S. John, is the book out already? 
Yes, it is. Yep, it's out. Um, it's on uh, hardback or softback, I guess you could say. And it's also on um, Kindle. And here within the next month, it will be out um, as uh, on Audible. So if you're into just listening, that's uh, definitely a way to go. That is a way to go. I have to ask you about a picture. The picture that my producer got of you that we have on our, um, you know, on our um, YouTube title screen, all these things. You're standing in a cemetery. That cemetery looks an awful like awful lot like the Evans City Cemetery. I don't know if if you know what the Evans City Cemetery is or if that's what that cemetery is, but it's very very uh, similar looking. If it's not, where was that taken? That was actually taken in a, a small cemetery in a small town uh, called Manaway. Um, it's uh, in northern Utah, uh, and uh, it, actually up in the mountains. But yeah, um, yeah. The Evans City Ce- the Evans City Cemetery. If you're not familiar with it, is the cemetery that that is used in the opening of the film Night of the Living Dead, George Romero's film. Oh yeah, you know yeah. Actually, I can it's Evans. See that now. Is it Evans City or Evans? I think it's Evans City. But anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a, quite a cool place. Uh, it's near Pittsburgh, actually. So let's talk about Black Eyed Kids. This is another one of those phenomena that uh, makes me kind of shudder a little bit because those stories are are very disturbing at times. And these somewhat innocent looking kids, with the exception of the fact that they have completely black eyes. Uh, you know, they mm-hmm. see, they're asking for help. They're knocking on doors. They're trying to, you know, get you to invite them in this, that, and the other thing. Um, you've got some of those stories in these books. I do. Yeah. I, I have quite a few, um, different stories, uh, with, uh, black eyed kids. Um, in the new book, I have a story which, um, falls under the, the black eyed kid story, but it's a little bit different than one that I had, that I had actually heard before when I interviewed, um, this couple, actually, they were in the mountains. They had gone for um, a week hike in uh, the Wind River Mountain Range, and that's actually in Wyoming. And um, as they were traveling up in, they were hiking back into the wilderness area. And well, oddly enough, um, when you go into the Wind Rivers, you have to sign up for certain times and all of this. So they want to make sure that you have an experience where you're not running into a lot of other people. Mm-hmm. And um, as they were traveling, they noticed that there was something, he noticed there was something in the tree line following them. And um, after a little while, his wife, you know, she noticed it as well. And there were people that were, um, that would step out into the trail or off, you know, between the trees and watch them. And they were, in what they explained, you know, old or Amish kind of clothes, mm-hmm. clothing, mm-hmm. and um, uh, they, when they would try and approach the people, they would disappear into the trees, and they weren't able to find them. Um, after, you know, talking about it, and they were able to get further up the trail, and they went several hours without seeing anybody, they, they felt comfortable enough to spend the night at uh, a lake that they had hiked to. They thought they were, you know, that it had all gone away. It was definitely creepy, but... Um, the next morning when he got up and walked down to the lake, there was a young girl, again, stepped out of the tree line in, the, in an old-style dress, and um, they were close enough at that point to see that they they seemed to have black eyes. And they, they you know, got he got back to camp, they threw everything together, and um, and were again followed by these, uh, these people all the way out of um, the trail. They just left as quickly as they could and ran into a few of them. And again, they seemed to have black eyes and, and, um, you know, pale expressions. And even though they didn't talk to them, you know, uh, I associated that with the black eyed kids and the same kind of thing. Um, I'd never heard of it in the wilderness before, but, um, for those, for the, I'm sure you don't have very many people who haven't heard of the black eyed kids, but, um, generally what happens is they will approach you, when you're alone, generally, either at home um, or out and about, and ask to either get in your car or in your house. And um, there's a feeling of dread that comes with these kids. Yeah. Uh, I, wrote a, I wrote of a story of a woman. She was alone uh, house-sitting for her parents, and two of the children came to the door and, and tried to get in, you know, tried to let her get her to let them in. And just the feeling of dread that comes with them and and the more persistent that they get, that they have to be invited into the house. And, 
it's it's definitely very creepy and and just a, a really dark vibe around uh, the story. It, it It is for sure. Um, you know, f- one of the fortunate things about much of this, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, take disappearances and kind of set them aside for a minute, as you mentioned, the David Pilates stuff. Um, but for the most part, people can have these experiences. And I'm not talking specifically about black eyed kids, kids. I'm talking about just general paranormal experiences. They can have these experiences and not get harmed by them. Have you had any stories shared to you that you either have or have not included in any of the books of people actually f- experiencing harm from their paranormal encounter? Um, you know, um, I, I've collected quite a few stories of people who have had um, experiences with um, with darker entities, I guess you could say. Um, I haven't included any of those in my books just because um, a lot of times I feel like um, People, some people may have gone looking for something like that, darker, and that's how they got attached or it got attached to them. Um, I did have a story that I put in my new book of a young woman and uh, her boyfriend. They were living in Salt Lake area. This is back in the 70s, if I remember correctly. And they had a ghost in the house, a very dark entity that was, you know, plaguing them and their dog. The dog really didn't like them. And like this entity and um the upstairs room the dog would go nowhere near the upstairs bedroom and um on one day she said that she had to she got called into work um, her boyfriend was already at work so she let the dog left the dog in the kitchen which is on the main floor and went to work and um her, later on that evening her boyfriend called her and said you know there's been something happened you need to come home and um when they got home, somehow the dog had been lured into the upstairs room and then the door had been shut and locked and the dog had scraped the inside of the door trying to get out and eventually jumped through the window, um, causing its death to try and get away from whatever it was. And so that's really probably the, probably the the darkest one that I've written about. Um, Her poor dog ended up dying because of the, the incident, but um, yeah, it definitely can, you know, come to harm. I think Uh, there's that line between ghosts and um, uh, I guess, dark or evil entities. Definitely. um, That, you know, you got to be very wary of when you're, when you're dealing with. There's uh, there are a lot of stories that uh, relate to cryptid type creatures like Bigfoot and other things. Did you uh, have any concentration of stories that relate to any specific cryptids? Um, you know, I've I've collected quite a few stories in the area that I live of Bigfoot, and what's really interesting is you know I interview these people and they tell me their stories, and I like to go to the area and mark it on a map and and everything. And what's very interesting is there's an area in the Cache National Forest and um, where I've interviewed people that seen Bigfoot. And again, they don't know each other and they don't really, you know, uh, talk to many people other than me, but I can draw, you know, a circle that's maybe five mile diameter and they all happen right within that circle. And so I find that really fascinating that there must be something in that area that keeps them there or that they're concentrated or something. But um, it definitely, uh, I guess, reiterates their stories and and, and um, verifies to them. I know um, not very long ago, I think it was in my, my book before this, I interviewed a woman and her and her husband were in the mountains uh, driving her Jeep and it was getting dusk. And she noticed that there was a man standing there at the tree line in dark clothes. And as they stopped, um, the man jumped into the tree and ran right to the top of the pine tree, like, like a a monkey would. (laughs) And that was at that point, they realized that it was covered in hair. And, um, I found it interesting, (sighs) pardon me, that it wasn't very tall. Maybe, maybe she said it was maybe five feet tall. And I, I talking to her and, and the way it acted, I thought, and believe it was a, a juvenile Bigfoot that they witnessed. And mm-hmm. its reaction to climbing the tree to get away from them 
was definitely fascinating. What is your favorite category? Is it ghosts or something else? You know, it kind of goes back and forth just depending on, on what I'm doing. Uh, I, I really do like Bigfoot. That uh, that's one that I that I really love. Um, that's one that's on my bucket list. I've I've never seen one, but I sure would love to do that. Um, go in an area and be able to see one. Um, growing up, I spent a lot of times a lot of time in the mountains, and um, I, that's definitely one that I would love to see. Is a Bigfoot, a Sasquatch. Do you um, have a lot of alien or UFO type stories in the series? Um, you know, I do have quite a few UFO stories, um, and again, I find it uh, fascinating, too. Um, we talk about uh, people who have experiences, and then uh, later on you find out that um, somebody has had a similar experience. I interviewed a gentleman uh, who, he was in the Wyoming area uh, between Idaho and Wyoming uh, delivering parts. That was his job. And he was driving to an area called Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and he had delivered the parts and was coming back, and it was getting late, and he always kept a bedroll in the back of his truck. Mm -hmm. And so he just stopped at the side of the road near uh, a spring, uh, near a little river, off in, you know, the wilderness, and and slept and was woken up in the middle of the night uh, by a humming sound and, and lights in his truck. And when he got out, there was a... Uh, a V-shaped UFO hovering about a hundred yards from him. And it, there was a beam and it was sucking water up out of the, the stream and he watched it. And then the beam shut off and he even, he was close enough. He said he could hear the water fall back down the water that had been suspended and didn't make it to the ship. And after a few minutes, it took off and was gone. And I interviewed him. And before I even put that in my book, I interviewed another gentleman who had the exact same experience 80 miles away with a round a UFO instead of a triangle, but the exact same thing had happened. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's so it's, it, they didn't know each other. It was 20 years apart that it had happened. And so it's really kind of fascinating that, um, two different people had the very same experience, 80 miles apart, 20 years different, and, and had never even spoken to each other or knew each other's stories. When you uh, decided to write, well, let me let me back up. You started with Stranger Bridgeland. You you continually expand the geography. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, the 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 subject matter. The more you learn about it, and the more you hear these stories, the more you want to know. I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, the more I like to learn, and and um, you know, even new stories that that I've never heard before or that don't relate to anything uh, exactly. I, I love to hear about those stories. And um, even though, like you say, the geography seems to continue to expound with people contacting me, um, uh, the stories are, like we talked about before, a little bit similar with UFOs and everything like that. But mm -hmm. um, I love stories that um, are are unique, for sure. Any of these stories, and I imagine the answer has to be yes, but I'll let you tell me. Uh, any of these stories, as you were hearing them, send shivers down your spine? In fact, maybe even to the point where you were hesitant to write about them? <laughs> um, yeah, I, there, there definitely are stories when I, you know, when I hear them and, and people talk to me. And yeah, they, they you know, bring shivers to my spine and um i'm never really hesitant to necessarily write them again i you know i have a lot that that may be more towards the demonic that i've kind of avoided writing about just because of the subject matter but um you know the more spooky or the more uh strange the story the definitely the more i want to write it and, and yeah. get it out there and, and entertain people with it so because it's, it's it's kind of like there's uh, the entertainment part of it, and then there's also, you know, the getting the stories um, written down and and sharing them and letting know people, letting people out there know that they're not alone, and so it's it's all kind of wrapped together. The um, 
interesting thing about a lot of this stuff, particularly for those of us who have this this curiosity that we've developed over the years, and John, of course, you have that same curiosity, is that when we hear some of these stories, we want to go out and experience them for ourselves. Have you heard of any, like, whether it's a, a Bigfoot sightings or a, a, an odd bridge that has weird property or anything like that, that you said, I've got to go check this out, and you've gone out and, and taken a look for yourself? Um, yeah, I, whenever it's a local story, especially, or within driving distance, um, I love to go and uh, visit the place and just get the feel of the area. Um, don't necessarily always have, you know, the same experience as those people, because as we know, it's it's kind of like a, a crapshoot, even when you right. go to a house that you know is haunted, right. um, whether you are going to experience something. But I definitely like to go there and, and spend some time and and kind of look things over. It helps me get in my eye what they went through at the time. When you collected the stories and you start talking to people, whether it's, you know, having a a real, you know, person to person conversation or you're corresponding through email or something else, did you notice any patterns in the type of people that have certain types of stories? In other words, are there certain types of people that are prone to ghost encounters and certain types of people that are prone to UFO encounters or are there no patterns that you saw? Um, you know, I, I definitely think that there are people out there that are more attuned to that, especially when it comes to ghosts and um, uh, the paranormal like that. Um, I think there's definitely people who are more, I guess you would say, psychically connected or mm-hmm. um, just connected in, in that way, um, almost to the point where um, ghosts maybe even be attracted to them. Um, and um, then there are people out there who've had a one-off experience, and, you know, they want to share that. And But it, it kind of piques their interest to the point where they want to go out and learn as much as they, as they can. And some of them really, you know, they turn to um, ghost hunting and to try and capture that feeling again, which I think is great. I think when you're, when you're going out and, and trying to capture that feeling again, it's, it's kind of amazing. What type of read are, are the books, particularly the new one? I'm sure they all have a very similar feel because they're a similar approach and it's a series of books. But would you describe these books as, uh, you know, kind of campfire, sit around the campfire, tell stories kind of read? Or is it more of a, an academic study? Um, more of, I think, more of a, a around the campfire kind of read. Um, kind of a, you know, looking for, you know, to get scared and, and kind of, you know, get that feeling of um, the paranormal. Um, I definitely think it's, it's more of that than um, uh, academic, though I do definitely um, think that books like this, especially um, for different areas, um, need to be documented and, and put in libraries so that, you know, later on generations or down the road, people can, can look up and see if um, what was going on and, and what were the experiences the people had? And even if they've had an experience, they can try and look up and find out, you know, am I alone in this? Were there other people who have experienced the same things that I have? Yeah. Yeah. What is it about us, most of us anyway, that just love that that adrenaline flow from hearing something that's a little bit scary, a little bit creepy, a little bit odd, you know, maybe a little bit threatening, but not too much threatening? What is it in us that likes yeah. that? You know, I, I, I think it is, um, it's a deep down, um, feeling that we have from our, you know, ancestors back in the day, the, the fact that, you know, when our ancestors were sitting around the fire, any Mm -hmm. bump in the night could be the next thing trying to eat us. (laughs) And, um, we're, we're right now, you know, we live fairly safe for the most part, um, but now it's kind of an adrenaline thing. It's a it's a feeling that we try and capture in a bottle, and um, it's just like you know normally people don't jump out of perfectly good airplanes, but a lot of people do that because they're looking for that that next high. Yeah, so maybe I never will, John. About. That's that's not something I'm ever going to do. I'll go ghost hunting, but I'm not <laughs> jumping out of a perfectly good airplane ever, 
ever. No, <laughs> there are some people that say, too. "Oh, I, I have to. I've got to get it off my bucket list." You know, it's something. No, thanks. <laughs> nope, not interested yep. in that one at all. Is there any uh, order that you recommend these books be read in, or can you pick up any one and feel just as comfortable then going back and pick up uh, you know one of the earlier ones? Yep, it, it doesn't really. It doesn't matter. There's no order to really read them in. Uh, it's because they're all different stories, and um, they don't necessarily, you know, relate back to anything. And and at the beginning of all of them, I kind of talk about my experiences and and what brought me into it. Um, each book is maybe give you a little bit different perspective, but uh, yeah, definitely any order is is just fine. So we've got a, a couple of questions in the chat room. Uh, one of them. In, um is uh, asking about why paranormal activity seems to occur mostly at night. And before I give give it to you, John, to take to answer, give your uh, thoughts on that, I just want to say, uh, Chatty, the person who asked that question, it, paranormal activity doesn't necessarily occur more at night than it does during the day. But I will tell you this, when you are looking for it at night, there are things that you can... Uh, see, you know, light anomalies will appear easier during the dark or generally at nighttime things are quieter so you can pick up audio anomalies and that kind of thing. So it's not necessarily that they occur more, but they, you might be more able to pick up uh, subtle differences in light or audio or whatever it happens to be. What are your thoughts about that, John? Yeah, I, I'm actually right on that with you. I think that we are more in tune at night. Um, you know, like you say, it's quieter. Um, our minds are probably a little bit quieter, you know, quieter, quieted down from the day. Um, but in my experience, especially in growing up in a home that was um, paranormally active, um, it, it could be any time of the day that uh, something would happen. And um, day or night, it, it didn't really matter, at least in my experience. Another thing that just that occurred to me too, and uh, let's let's speculate a little bit. Maybe we can we can uh, answer some questions that haven't been answered here. Um, you know, I I'm, I have a radio background. I've owned radio stations. I you know it's been my business for a lot of years, so I know a lot about it. And one of the things I do know about radio waves and, and radio frequencies and that energy is that sun the sun can affect it. Sunspots can affect it. Uh, you know, sa- if you've got satellite signals coming in uh, from wherever it is, sunspots can can affect those signals. I'm wondering if energy from the sun actually can p- interfere with e- whatever the energies are, the vibrations are that help some of these spirits manifest. And therefore, when we aren't in direct sunlight, or we, you know, the sun is on the other side of the earth, uh, it isn't affecting those things as much. It isn't interfering as much. What do you think about that? That could very well be. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense because, like you say, um, any number of um, of the sun's rays and, and um, the way it affects our atmosphere definitely could, you know, put a damper on that. Um, that makes a lot of sense, actually, when you say that. Yeah, that's something that just occurred to me. Maybe you and I have to write a book about this. Yeah, yeah, we might be on to something. So, John, where can people get? That's a question. Oh, sorry, no, go sorry. ahead. No. I was going to say that's a question I get quite a bit. Is yeah. you know, especially from skeptical people, they're like, "Why does it only happen at night?" And and that's the first thing I say is, "Well, it doesn't always happen to happen at night, but a lot of times, you know." We're, we're quieter at yeah. that well, here, time. Here, here's a perfect example of how this works, and it's another radio example. But when you listen to AM radio specifically, or shortwave radio, but AM is what many people are familiar with, you, can, you pick up stations during the day that are close to you. But when you listen at night, you can pick up stations from across the country because the sun is no right. longer interfering with those waves. And, um, you know, again, it could be something to do with the sun interfering with whatever energies it is that paranormal entities use to manifest or manipulate. So uh, this is something that, that I think maybe deserves a little more thought. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I, I had not heard of that, but it makes perfect sense. Um, that makes perfect sense. And, and you know, it's interesting that you mentioned with the sun and everything, because as humans, we only see a very small spectrum of, of the light that's, right. uh, that's actually visible. And so that could definitely have something to do with it as well. Um, just the fact that, you know, now we're lucky enough to have cameras that, that pick up ultraviolet and stuff like that. But um, that could also be affected by the sun, you know, sun's rays if, if something's coming in ultraviolet because you're just getting lamb blasted with ultraviolet from the sun at all times when it's up. So Yeah, great point. Where can people get the books again? 
Um, so they can be picked up on Amazon. Uh, just look up any of the books on Amazon, and they're available uh, softback or Kindle versions. And again, uh, they will all be available here shortly on um, Audible. So if you enjoy listening, uh, definitely look them up on there. So, you know, we go from Stranger Bridgerland to Stranger West to Stranger U.S. This geography keeps expanding. What's next? You know, I'm working on the next one. Um, I'm getting stories, again, from all over the United States. Uh, I'm in the process of writing them up right now and going through some of my older ones to see if there's some in there that can go in. And so as long as there's going to be paranormal stories and people that want to talk to me, I'm just going to keep going because I love doing it. Uh, I love talking to people about it and getting their stories. I like to go out and, and speak at confer- conferences. Hopefully when the COVID, COVID's over and yeah. things start opening up, we can get back to doing that again, which would be great. And if somebody, I love meeting people face-to-face. So. If somebody has a story or an experience they'd like to share with you, how would they do that? So um, you can go to my website, which is strangerbridgerland.com. Uh, you can look that up on Google. It'll come up. And there's a section there where you can contact me through the through the website, and I'm usually really good to get back to you as soon as I can because, again, I like to uh, get your story as quick as I can and, and talk to you. It's I just l- love that part, uh, getting people's stories. So that's the best way to contact me is through my website. Terrific. John, when you uh, have the next one ready to go, be sure to reach out to us. Let us know. We'd love to have you back on so we can talk about that. That would be awesome. I really appreciate you having me on. It's always a blast to talk to you, J.V. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.